Hello everyone, this is the first in a short subset of my intro to EKG videos, which will cover tachyarrhythmias. The specific topic today is the mechanisms underlying those rhythms. The learning objectives are to explain the three major mechanisms of tachyarrhythmia generation and propagation, which include increased automaticity, reentry, and triggered activity. Although this video is not the last in this introductory course on EKGs, it will nevertheless be the most advanced in terms of presenting concepts that some clinicians never need to worry about. If you are going through these EKG videos for the purposes of learning simple interpretation, and you doubt that the pathophysiologic mechanisms of the rhythms will enter into your daily practice, then you should feel free to skip ahead to the next video, which will cover the six categories of tachyarrhythmias based on their EKG characteristics. However, for any trainee entering careers in cardiology, critical care, hospitalist medicine, anesthesia, or emergency medicine, I highly recommend watching this video through to the end. Although knowledge of the underlying physiology is not necessary for diagnosing the majority of arrhythmias, it is necessary for diagnosing the most complex of them, as well as for the understanding of management strategies. For the video, I'll be assuming a very basic knowledge of cellular physiology, including vague familiarity with the terms membrane potential and action potential. As I listed at the beginning, one of the general mechanisms of arrhythmogenesis is increased automaticity. However, to understand the principles of increased automaticity, one must first understand the principles of normal automaticity. Automaticity describes the property of some cardiac myocytes to undergo spontaneous depolarization initiating an electrical impulse. This is the consequence of something called phase four depolarization. This graph shows the action potential across the membrane of these myocytes. The action potential itself begins with a relatively rapid depolarization in phase zero and is immediately followed by repolarization in phase three. In contrast to most myocytes, in which the membrane potential during phase four is constant due to balance of inward and outward currents, in myocytes displaying automaticity, the inward current during phase four exceeds the outward current. Thus, there is slow spontaneous depolarization until a threshold potential is reached and an action potential is fired at the beginning of phase zero. If you're wondering what happened to phases two and three, although most cells have these phases, the myocytes which undergo automaticity do not as a consequence of expressing a different set of ion channels in their membranes. The rate of automaticity depends upon three factors. First, the rate of phase four depolarization. The faster phase four depolarization occurs, that is, the steeper that part of the curve is, the more frequent the triggered action potentials will be. Next is the maximum negative membrane potential, which is the potential at the transition from phase three to phase four. And finally, the threshold potential at which an action potential is fired which is at the transition from phase four to zero. This type of automaticity normally occurs within specialized pacemaker cells within the sinus node, also called the SA node for sinoatrial, as well as within latent pacemakers spread throughout the atria, AV junction, and ventricles. The normal intrinsic rates of each pacemaker site depends upon its anatomic location within the heart. In general, the higher or more proximal the pacemaker is, the faster the intrinsic rate. So the normal rate of the sinus node, which is the heart's chief pacemaker, is 50 to 90 beats per minute. Latent atrial pacemakers, which are mainly clustered specifically in the right atrium, in the crista terminalis, near the coronary sinus, and adjacent to the tricuspid valve, spontaneously depolarize at approximately 40 to 60 beats per minute. The AV junction pacemakers depolarize also at about 40 to 60 beats per minute. And latent pacemakers within the his purkinje system are at 15 to 40 beats per minute. The latent pacemakers lying distal to the sinus node are essentially fail-safe mechanisms. In the event of sinus node failure, patients do not typically experience cardiac arrest, but rather develop what's called an escape rhythm, which is driven from one of these sites at their intrinsic rate. The exact rate of normal automaticity in both the sinus node and latent pacemakers is dependent upon the balance between the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. 
The sympathetic nervous system acts by releasing norepinephrine by nerve fibers directly to the heart, as well as triggering a systemic epinephrine release by the adrenal glands. These two compounds, which act in the body as both hormones and neurotransmitters, are called catecholamines. Both epi and norepi activate beta-1 adrenergic receptors on the pacemaker myocytes, which increases the slope of phase 4 depolarization, leading to an increase in automaticity and thus heart rate. This is the major mechanism by which sinus tachycardia develops. To demonstrate what this looks like, here are some normal action potentials from pacemakers. When the slope of phase 4 increases, if the threshold potential at which the action potential is fired remains the same, action potentials will necessarily develop with greater frequency. In the parasympathetic nervous system, acetylcholine released by parasympathetic fibers traveling through the vagus nerve activate muscarinic receptors on the pacemaker myocytes. This decreases the slope of phase 4 and hyperpolarizes the resting membrane potential. The consequence is a decrease in automaticity and thus heart rate. Here's the normal action potentials again and a more gradual phase 4 slope combined with hyperpolarization. So now that we understand normal automaticity, what causes increased automaticity? Well, there are two types of increased automaticity. The first is called enhanced normal automaticity. This occurs only within specialized pacemaker cells and is the consequence of those cells doing what they're supposed to be doing in response to various stimuli. Example of etiologies in this category are stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system, as you might see in sepsis, hypovolemia, exercise, fear, or most forms of pain. Inhibition of the parasympathetic nervous system can also do this, as can be caused by medications or disruption of the vagus nerve. ATP depletion from hypoxemia or ischemia can lead to enhanced normal automaticity, as can digoxin toxicity and hypokalemia. These last three etiologies all share in common a reduction in the activity of the membrane sodium-potassium pump. In contrast, abnormal automaticity only occurs within non-pacemaker cells in which it is associated with a decrease in the resting potential, the exact mechanism of which is complex and not completely understood. The main etiologies of abnormal automaticity is acute ischemia and or reperfusion, such as what can occur immediately after stenting of an acutely occluded artery during cardiac cath. Another cause is congestive heart failure. The next general mechanism of tachyarrhythmia is reentry. Reentry is responsible for the majority of clinically relevant tachyarrhythmias. It occurs when electrical impulse doesn't cease at the end of one cardiac cycle but rather persists and re-excites the heart as part of a self-propagating mechanism. Reentrant tachycardias are rarely referred to by a variety of other names, including but not limited to reciprocating tachycardias and circus movement tachycardias. For the most part, these alternative terms are archaic and fell from popularity several decades ago. I'm now going to go through the actual mechanism of reentry. Because it's both complicated and really important, I'm actually going to review it twice, the first time largely with verbal description, and the second with animation. So what are the conditions necessary for reentry to occur? First, there must exist two adjacent pathways with different electrophysiologic properties, such as conduction velocity and refractoriness, which are connected both proximally and distally. Then a premature action potential hits. It can be from the atria, it can be from the ventricles, it can be from the AV junction, it can be from anywhere. But the key is the fact that it is premature means that one of the two pathways may have unilateral block caused by either prolonged refractory time or prolonged repolarization. So the premature action potential travels just down the unblocked pathway, which must have slow enough conduction for the previously blocked pathway to have recovered, allowing for retrograde conduction such that at their point of distal connection, the action potential now travels retrograde up that initially blocked pathway. When the retrograde wave of depolarization meets the proximal connection, if the refractory time in the initially unblocked pathway is short enough, it is now capable of depolarization again, this time in an antegrade fashion 
like the time before, that is, in a fashion where the wavefront of depolarization moves proximally to distally. And you can see how the depolarization wave is now in a seemingly endless loop. All of this may have seemed a bit confusing to follow, so let's take a look at a simple animation for clarity. So this will represent our two pathways with a proximal and distal connection. The so-called fast pathway has fast conduction velocity and long refractory time. The slow pathway has slow conduction velocity and short refractory time. Normally, as an electrical signal comes from above, it will reach the proximal connection and travel down both pathways. Since the fast pathway is necessarily faster than the slow pathway, by the time the impulse from the slow pathway reaches the distal junction, the distal end of the fast pathway is already there, and therefore that tissue is refractory, and no reentrant loop can be established. However, imagine a single premature action potential occurs, which strikes the proximal junction at a moment when the fast pathway is still refractory, and only the slow pathway can conduct. The depolarization wave now moves down the slow pathway in an antegrade fashion, but when it reaches the distal junction, the distal end of the fast pathway is not refractory. Therefore, in addition to the wave continuing distally, it also travels backwards or retrograde up the fast pathway. When it reaches the proximal junction, the slow pathway is no longer refractory, since it has a short refractory time, and thus the impulse goes back down the slow pathway and an endless loop is established. Reentry is often subdivided into two categories based on whether the reentrant circuit is large enough to be mapped via catheter during an EP study. Macro reentry is said to be present when the circuit is large enough to be mapped. This is the case with rhythms such as atrial flutter and something called AVRT, not to be confused with AVNRT. Micro reentry is when the circuit is too small to be mapped. This is the case with atrial fibrillation and something called intraatrial reentrant tachycardia, which is a subset of something more broadly known as just atrial tachycardia. And yes, I realize the terminology can be really confusing. And to make matters worse, you'll notice that AVNRT is not listed here in either category. That's because it sort of straddles the border between the two. Most cases of AVNRT are best classified as micro reentry but there are reported cases of macro reentrant AVNRT, which are probably the result of one arm of the reentrant circuit extending into the perinodal atrial tissue. As a result, most cardiologists tend to not consider AVNRT as belonging to either category in the strictest sense. And for the particularly curious viewers, the anatomic scale of how large a reentrant circuit can be, but still be too small to be mapped, it's approximately four millimeters in diameter which is the approximate width of the catheter tip used in mapping studies. Types of reentry can also be described using a different dichotomy. In anatomic reentry, the circuit encircles an anatomic obstacle, such as a reentrant ventricular tachycardia encircling a post infarct myocardial scar. In functional reentry, the circuit depends not on a grossly observable anatomic obstacle, but rather depends upon the intrinsic heterogeneity of the electrophysiologic properties of the myocardium. The classic example is atrial fibrillation. Although this dichotomy is frequently mentioned in textbooks, I find it less useful in clinical settings and personally favor the macro versus micro reentry distinction. The final mechanism of tachyarrhythmias is triggered activity. Triggered activity occurs when depolarizing oscillations of the membrane potential occur either during or after an action potential in which one oscillation is strong enough to trigger a new action potential. These oscillations are called after depolarizations. Take a look at this action potential, which is occurring in a non-pacing myocyte. Notice this little bump at the end of the plateau phase. That bump, which should not be there, is occurring during phase two and is therefore called a phase two after depolarization. Here's a phase three after depolarization and a phase four after depolarization. Considering the cellular mechanisms and etiologies, phase two and three after depolarizations are grouped together and are called early after depolarizations, 
while phase four is called delayed after the polarizations. The general mechanism of early after polarizations is largely related to a prolonged action potential. Common etiologies include hypokalemia and essentially any cause of QT prolongation, particularly numerous medications and the different variations of congenital long QT syndrome. The risk of having early after depolarizations increases at slower heart rates. The general mechanism of delayed after depolarizations is related to excess intracellular calcium. Common etiologies include ischemia, excess catecholamines, and the Jackson toxicity. The risk of delayed after depolarizations increases at faster heart rates. One important way to distinguish the mechanisms of increased automaticity, reentry, and triggered activity from one another, either on the hospital ward or in the EP lab, is the effect of a premature stimulus on the rhythm. Rhythms caused by increased automaticity can neither be initiated nor terminated by a premature stimulus. In contrast, reentry almost always requires a premature stimulus for initiation and can usually be terminated by a well-timed premature stimulus, though this is not necessarily required. Triggered activity can be initiated by a premature stimulus, but it's not necessarily required, and it can rarely be terminated by such, though as above, it is also not necessarily required for termination. I'm going to end this video with this chart. I won't go through it in any detail since you may not yet be familiar with many of the example arrhythmias, However, it demonstrates how tachyarrhythmias can be divided by mechanism into one of three categories, and how each category essentially has two subcategories, which we just went over. You'll notice that many example arrhythmias show up in the chart more than once, which is obviously because they can be the consequence of more than one mechanism. For example, atrial tachycardia can be the result of enhanced normal automaticity, abnormal automaticity, micro-reentry, or delayed after depolarizations. In the event that you are not yet familiar with many of the arrhythmias listed, I recommend watching my next two videos on identifying tachyarrhythmias on EKG, and then coming back to this video specifically to look at this chart. I think doing so will help solidify your understanding of the relationship between mechanisms and specific diagnoses, which will be particularly helpful in understanding approaches to management.